are continuing with our marriage series, Better Not Worse. And while I love that line in the wedding vows, it says, I've married you for better or for worse, richer for poor. That's great. It says, I'm committed. I'm in there. I'm not giving up. I won't quit no matter what. At the same time, we believe the Word of God teaches marriages can get better. Amen? And even if your marriage has gotten worse, you can rebound and you can see your marriage get better. And so that's what we've been doing the past uh, several weeks on Wednesday night. We've been learning how to make marriage better. Tonight, I want to call my message an F5 marriage tornado. An F5 marriage tornado. I saw someone recently uh, use this illustration of a tornado. And they talked about an F5, the five Fs of a tornado that will absolutely bring devastation into a marriage. And they, they gave these five Fs, and I was just so moved by it, I turned this little illustration into an entire message for you tonight. They said it starts off there at the top with frustration. You know, it's easy to get frustrated in your marriage. It's easy to begin to think, oh my, I'm just so, this is so irritating. They're, they're making me so mad. They just, oh, I'm so frustrated with marriage, with my spouse. And then frustration ends up creating false assumptions. That's the next part. Notice how it goes in a circle there. As it begins to twist around, you get to false assumptions. And then, you know, you start assuming things because, again, you're frustrated. And then you start assuming things that more than likely aren't even true. They don't love me anymore. They were trying to hurt my feelings. They're, they're cheating on me. They're doing this. They're doing that. They're, they don't care about me. They just ignore me. They don't care about my feelings. They, they don't love me. You start making those false assumptions. I'd be happier if I were somewhere else with somebody else or if I weren't married. And then once you get frustration and false assumptions working together, they end up converging and producing fighting. You start arguing with each other and sometimes it becomes more than arguing. It becomes yelling and screaming and, you know, slamming doors and somebody sleeping on a couch and, and somebody sleeping in the bedroom and you start fighting. Well, uh, everybody fights a little, but when fighting becomes prolonged and, and extended and, and, and eventually it can produce fatigue, you end up with, with marriage fatigue and you just get tired. You know, the Bible, Bible talks about our God as being a God who gives us peace and a God who gives us strength, but sometimes you just feel so tired. It reminds me of the verse that says, don't grow weary in well-doing. If you can grow weary in well-doing, imagine how weary and fatigued you can get when the marriage is not doing well, right? And so you get fatigued, and now you're wanting to give up, and you're ready to quit. And that leads then to this next part of this cyclone, fantasy. Fantasy. This is when you start fantasizing about things like, well, if I were single, life would be better. If I hadn't married them, life would be better. Or if I'd married my college girlfriend, maybe things would have turned out better for me. Maybe I should have stuck that out. Or you start fantasizing about what life would have been like with your high school sweetheart. And next thing you know, you know you're, you're starting to fantasize about how much better it would be if you were somewhere else doing something else with someone else. And then the problem is, though, once you get to fantasy... It just circles back around again, and even if the fantasy doesn't turn into a full-fledged affair, boom, you're frustrated again. You're frustrated again, and it just keeps going. Frustration, false assumptions, then to the fighting, then to the fatigue, then to the fantasy, then back to more frustrations. And this thing keeps spinning faster and faster and more violent. And before you know it, you've got some serious issues going on in your marriage. So I want to help you to overcome the F5 marriage tornado, okay? Can we talk about it a little bit? Let's go to the top. Frustration. Frustration. That's the first thing you got to do is deal with what's creating the frustration in your marriage. One of the number one sources of frustration, I believe, is simply the world. The teaching of the world. The mentality of the world. The world's way of doing things. If you're trying to build your marriage Hollywood's way or the politically correct way or the way somebody on television or in a magazine is telling you you need to, to live out your marriage or if you're basing your marriage on some self-help book that's not based on the Word of God or you're just trying to take the advice of some unsaved friends and, and somebody over here that's been married for three months and suddenly they're experts and they've got the best marriage in the world. Listen, if you go that route, you are going to constantly be frustrated, okay? Can I just tell you this? Do not take marriage advice from somebody that's been married two years or less or three years or less, okay? We, we make sure every year when we have our married couple's Valentine banquet, it's an annual event here, 
we make sure whoever we bring in has been married a minimum of 20 years, preferably 30 plus. We've, had, we've actually had people come in to teach that have been married 60 years, 50 years, and 60 years. Because when I bring somebody in to teach you about marriage, I want somebody that's been there and done that and has got the t-shirt. Hello? I want you to have some wisdom. So it's easy to get frustrated when you start looking at movies and trying to build your marriage off a of rom-com. If you try to build your marriage off Hallmark movies, you're going to be disappointed all the time because it's not always going to snow at that magical moment, okay? You know, I'm sorry, uh, every time a bell rings, an angel doesn't get their wings. You can't base your love life off of Hollywood. Hello, that's not the way it works. And if you're trying to, to build your marriage according to the specs of, of the world, you're going to constantly be frustrated because you'll never measure up. It'll always look easier on television. It'll always seem more fun on television. That's one reason people are so frustrated because they think their spouse ought to act like that person in the movie. They're not going to. They're actors. Just in case you didn't know, it's all fake out there in Hollywood. It's fake. Hello. They're acting. And so, you know, that's one of the real issues with pornography is you got somebody doing something on film that they would never naturally do. And so you, you watch that stuff, and next thing you know, you want your spouse to act like that person in that movie, and they're just not going to do it because that's not real. That's make-believe. So number one source of frustration is trying to build your life the world's way. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19 through 22 says this, When people tell you, try out the fortune tellers, consult the spiritualist, why not tap into the spirit world? Get in touch with the dead. Tell them no. We're going to study the scriptures. When people try to tell you some article in Cosmopolitan is going to make your marriage better, tell them no. I go to the Bible to get my marriage advice. When somebody tells you talk to Dr. Phil, say no, I talk to Dr. Jesus, the great physician. He takes care of my marriage. If you go to the world, the verse goes on to say you'll end up being frustrated and famished. It will frustrate you if you try to take the world's advice on how to have a great marriage because the world is incapable of having great marriages. Remember that scripture that gets read a lot in marriage ceremonies. I know I use it in almost every one. It says a threefold cord is not easily broken. A twofold cord can be broken because threefolds is you, your spouse, and God. And when you pull God out of that cord, the cord is easily cut, okay? So you need to know that. You need to be aware that you just can't, it's going to frustrate you to try and build your world, your marriage according to the world's specifications. Number two, own your frustration, don't rent it. Okay, I'm going to explain that. That may seem a little, little bizarre. I'm, I'm going to explain it. Own your frustrations, don't rent them from somebody else. Now, people say this all the time. They make me so mad. That is not true. You choose to respond to not getting what you want with anger. But the moment you say, they make me mad, my spouse makes me mad, you've just given them ownership of your emotions. Amen. Hello, you've just given them ownership of your emotions. Now think about it. If you rent, if somebody rents a house, there's less responsibility there. You don't have to do as much maintenance. But the problem is, people who rent statistically don't take as good a care of a home as somebody who owns a home will take care of it. And then if you're a renter of the home, not only do you probably not maintain it like you should, you also can't make all the improvements you want to make because it's not your house, right? Well, that's what happens when you give somebody else ownership of your emotions. You put yourself in a position where now you can't maintain your marriage like you need to, and you don't have the ability to improve it either because you're letting somebody else control your emotions. You've got to make up your mind. My emotions are controlled through the Holy Spirit. I have the gift of self-control. Everybody say, I have self-control. Self again, again, you choose to respond in anger. You can make that choice. James 4 verse 2 says this. You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. Did you see all the you's in that verse? You, 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 you. You have to make a choice. I'm not going to allow my spouse to manipulate my emotions. I'm going to live a self-controlled life through the Holy Spirit and I'm going to choose. Here's the thing. You've got to make up your mind that instead of reacting, you're going to respond. Instead of reacting, respond. 
Too many people spend their life and their marriage reacting. They get a little upset. Things don't go their way. They don't like something, and so they blow up and they react. But what we ought to be doing is responding. We ought to take time to step back, to meditate on the Word of the Lord, to look at the situation, to pray and say, Holy Spirit, help me formulate a response, not just to react. Because most of the time when you react, it's going to be 95% emotion, 5% actual thinking, okay? And so you're going to end up doing things that you regret. It's like that verse of Scripture I love to quote out of the Old Testament that says, the heart is deceitful above all things. If you're operating out of the heart, out of the emotions, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. You're going to be deceived a lot. You have to make up your mind, I'm going to stop reacting and I'm going to start responding. Proverbs 13 verse 3 says, those who guard their lips preserve their lives. But those who speak rashly will come to ruin. Listen, your marriage will come to ruin if you speak rashly. If you say and do things without first stepping back and praying about it and seeing what the Word of God has to say about it and getting wise counsel, if you just jump out and you just say what's on your mind in the heat of emotion, you are going to do some serious damage to your relationship and you're going to cause you and your spouse a lot of frustration. Another way that we end up creating a lot of frustration is with a lack of respect and honor. When you disrespect, dishonor someone, you create frustration in their life, and ultimately you'll create frustration in yours. In Romans chapter 12, verse 10, it says, be devoted to one another in love. Listen to the last half of the verse. Honor one another. Honor one another. There's another passage, I believe it's in Ephesians, that says, submit to one another. The idea is respect one another. Show one another honor. When you talk down to your spouse, you're creating frustration in their life. When you use manipulative words and emotions in speaking to your spouse and you dishonor them, you disrespect them, you are, you are putting frustration into their heart. When you, when you uh, make them look bad in front of family or coworkers, if you're, if you're speaking to them in a condescending fashion or you're giving them that eye roll and that tone of voice that says, I think you're stupid, you've just disrespected them and you've just created a lot of friction a lot of frustration in the marriage so you need to you need to think about what you're going to say respond carefully and make sure you're not speaking and talking and acting in a way that disrespects and dishonors your spouse uh, another great source of frustration is ignoring ignoring your spouse or ignoring an issue listen this was my big mistake during the early years, the first couple of years of our marriage, Christy and I, and we've been married now for 32, going on 33 years, but I made that big mistake of thinking what so many guys think, if I just ignore it, maybe it'll go away. Amen. It doesn't go away. I'm just going to be honest with you. It does not go away. Some of the biggest longest lasting fights we had in those early years of our marriage should have ended in five or ten minutes but I ignored the situation I didn't want to deal with it I just wanted to to walk away and hope everything worked out but let me tell you it does not work that way those problems do not just go away and actually what happens when you choose to ignore these problems they actually end up multiplying it, it creates an, an abundance of frustration so you got to make up your mind that you're not going to multiply your frustration by ignoring it Matthew chapter 5 verse 25 says this settle matters quickly with your adversary now hopefully your spouse isn't your adversary the next verse talks about not you know dealing with it before they take you to court hopefully your spouse isn't taking you to court I hope not but the principle still applies to marriage. You need to deal with things quickly. Don't give time for those wounds to, to become large and huge. Don't give time for bitterness to develop in your spouse's heart or in your heart. There's a reason why the Word of God says in Ephesians 4, verse 26, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Don't, you need to deal with it. You can't wait. You can't allow those feelings to sit in there and sit, soak, and sour. You need to deal with those situation so you can't just ignore it you got to deal with it and deal with it quickly don't don't let frustration simmer I'll tell you a story one night uh, it was in the evening uh, Christy said hey would you do me a favor would you make sure and uh, turn off the crock pot and, and once the uh, the green beans cool make sure you put them in, in a Tupperware container and put them in the refrigerator I said, sure of course well the next morning uh, we get up and something doesn't smell right and uh, 
We look everywhere. We're like, well, maybe it's the garbage. No, but the garbage can is empty. We thought, well, maybe there's something in the refrigerator that's gone bad. So we checked the refrigerator. Then we went to the deep freeze to make sure something hadn't thawed out. Nothing was wrong with the deep freeze. We, we kept smelling that smell. And the longer in the day we, we waited, the stronger it got. We went into the pantry, thought maybe there's a, a, ba uh, you know, a baking potato that's gotten dropped in the floor. And we didn't notice it. And that's what's smelling up the house. It's, getting, it's starting to get really putrid. It's, it's bad. I mean, it's like stomach turning kind of bad. And we're looking around everywhere. What in the world is causing the smell? Did an animal crawl under the house and die? And I look over, and I see the crockpot light is on. And suddenly it dawns on me, uh-oh, I didn't deal with the green beans. Now, those green beans were wonderful 16 hours ago. They weren't so wonderful after sitting on the simmer setting for 24 hours, okay? That did not work well at all. I opened up the, the lid off of that pot. It stunk so bad. And I got it, took it outside, dumped it out. And, of course, Christy's like, I thought you said you were going to. I, no, I forgot, you know. And my point is this. If you let problems, if you let frustration simmer in your marriage, your marriage will begin to stink, you will find your marriage very, very unappealing because frustration, if it sits there, it will create bitterness and it'll create hurts and pains. It'll begin to multiply frustration. It'll make your marriage stink. So uh, don't let it simmer. Deal with it. Everybody say, deal with it. Deal with it. Unresolved frustration, if you don't deal with it, this is what happens. You move to that next area of the cyclone. You develop false assumptions. Suddenly you begin to think things like, well, other couples are happier than we are. You begin to assume, well, they don't like me as much as they like their job or playing golf, or they think I'm dumb, or they don't appreciate me, or they wish they hadn't married me, or they just aren't happy anymore, and they blame me for all the problems. And, you know, you'll just start making stuff up. I mean, think about it. The very first sin that was ever created, that ever committed, was committed because Satan deceived Eve into believing God felt a way he didn't feel. He convinced Eve, God's holding something back from you. God apparently doesn't want you to have knowledge, but if you'd eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'd be as smart as God. God's trying to withhold wisdom and knowledge from you, and she believed that she, she had a false assumption about God, and that led to the first sin. It brought sin into the world. And I'm telling you, if you don't deal with frustration, next thing you know, you'll be getting all these false assumptions in your head and you'll start believing things about your spouse and about your marriage or maybe about you. You'll start saying, it must be because I'm, I'm ugly now because I'm older than I was and I guess they, they're probably wanting some younger person and they don't care about me or they, they don't like this about me or they don't like that or they think I'm a failure. The devil will fill your mind full of false assumptions. Everybody say, it's a lie. It's a lie. It is a lie. Um, I don't. I don't know how many times uh, Christy and I said this while we were dating. Here's a. Here's a big. Here's a big false assumption. The false assumption is if we really love each other, we won't have any fights or problems. <laughs> Christy and I were dating. We're dumb seventeen-year-olds, and I remember us saying this many times. When we get married, we're not going to fight like our parents because we love each other too much. Any of you ever said something dumb like that when you were there? Oh, we, we won't be like our parents. No, we love each other, so that'll never happen. Listen, don't, don't, don't buy into the false assumption that because there's a problem, because you're not getting along, because you're going through a rocky season that the marriage is over and that it's hopeless and it's not going to work, that is not true. The fact is sometimes you are going to have fights and disagreements and, and problems. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 17 says this. Throughout their lives, they live under a cloud, or we could say a, a funnel cloud because of the title of the message. They live under a funnel cloud, frustrated, discouraged, and angry. Notice frustrated and angry are grouped together there. Because when you have a lot of frustration in your life, and let me just say this, if you're frustrated with your life, you will end up being frustrated with your marriage. If you're frustrated with yourself, if you're frustrated with God, if you're frustrated in general, that's going to end up bleeding over into your marriage. And Satan will, at some point, try to convince you the marriage is the problem. And if you weren't married to them, then you could be happy. If you were divorced, you would be happy. If you would married somebody else, you will be happy. Don't make those assumptions. Those are lies. Yes, sometimes you're, you're going to not get along. Sometimes you're going to disagree, but that's okay. Just work it out quickly. 
work it out quickly. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and deal with it. Don't, don't, don't let the sun go down on your anger. I can tell you some of our biggest fights in our marriage have occurred because I let things go too long. What should have been a 15-minute discussion turned into a 15-day day of being mad at each other, period, because I didn't deal with it when I should have. I, we didn't immediately deal with the problem. We let things go, and it became a lot bigger than it should have been. Uh, so don't remember, if you leave the green beans simmering, they're going to stink, right? Learn from my mistakes, okay? Don't let the problems in your marriage simmer, but understand sometimes they're going to come, but just deal with them. Everybody say deal with them. Deal with them. Deal with them. Now, here's the thing. Yes, everybody has disagreements in the marriage. Occasionally, you're going to have that fight or a tiff or whatever you want to call it. Some people say, I don't fight. They just argue with a really soft tone. That's, that's what they're calling not fighting, I think. But uh, sometimes you fight. But when you have prolonged fighting, when you have intense fighting, when, you, when the fighting gets hurtful, that's when you reach that point in our cyclone of fatigue. You just start getting tired. You start getting weary. It's like I said earlier, the Bible says that, you know, e even, the, uh, even those who are doing well can grow weary in well-doing. And then if you're in the middle of a marriage that's not currently doing well, it's, it's easy to get tired. You're like... I'm tired of trying to keep them happy. I'm tired of trying, uh, tired of walking on pins and needles thinking everything I do, they're going to dislike and pick a fight about it. I'm, I'm tired of arguing. I'm tired of this. And then the enemy will, will start to talk to you about your fatigue and say, yeah, you're pretty tired. You ought to just give up. There's really no hope anymore. Why don't you just give up? Come on, you're tired. Listen, just because you're tired, that does not mean the marriage is over. Just because you are tired, that doesn't mean... The marriage is over. It means this. Psalm 30 verse 5 says, Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Amen. If you're going through a night period in your marriage, just hang in there. Be faithful. Keep seeking God. The morning is eventually going to come, and then you're going to have joy once again in your marriage. Again, we make false assumptions, and one big false assumption is once that joy is gone, once we are no longer enjoying the marriage. Once we're fatigued, Satan says, it's over. You might as well give up. Move on to somebody else. You can't repair the marriage. That is not true. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Now, if you don't deal with fatigue or if you find yourself starting to feel like giving up during the fatigue, that's when you roll into that final part of the cyclone. And that's when you get into fantasy. And this is a very, very dangerous place to be. Again, this is where you start fantasizing and thinking, wow, back, if I were single again, life would be good because back when I was single, I used to have a lot of fun. You know, like, as a matter of fact, I, I had lots of fun until I met them and we got married. So if I were single again, things would be better. Or you start fantasizing about other people. Again, it could be about the ex-girlfriend from college or the high school sweetheart. Or it could be, wow, if only I'd married somebody like my coworker in the cubicle across from me. They don't nag me. Matter of fact, unlike my spouse, they're always affirming me and telling me what a good job I'm doing. I haven't heard, wow, you look nice today for my spouse in months. But they say something almost every day about how nice I look. And the enemy will start playing with your brain and start telling you, wow, life would be so much better with them. Or, you know, you start, you, you, get, you get fatigued. Next thing you know, you're online on social media, and you're starting to reconnect with people. Or maybe you're connecting with new people. I don't know. You get on there, and you start sending messages, and next thing you know, you're reconnected with that old girlfriend or some coworker, and you start sending those little nice little notes back and forth, and suddenly you start fantasizing about how great life would be if I were with them. Can, can I tell you something? If marriage with your current spouse stinks, if you marry somebody else, eventually that one will stink too because you're going to bring the, the rotten green beans with you. You're going to bring the stink with you, folks. I mean, I, the, I, you don't know how many people that I have talked to. Oh, oh, it's going to be better this time unless, unless Jesus gets involved and you begin to change things and you deal with the frustration and you deal with the fatigue and you deal with the false assumptions and you learn how to fight correctly and work through things. You're going to have the same problems in the next relationship you're having in this one. So you have to make up your mind you're not going to fantasize. Now, the thing about fantasy... His fantasy piles on more and more frustration. 
And guess what? Now you're going through that cycle all over again. Now you've got frustration. Then you've got false assumptions coming up again, and you're thinking crazy thoughts, and then the fighting starts again. And then you're fatigued, and you're ready to give up, and then you start fantasizing again. Oh boy, this would be great if I had them in my life. Why, why, couldn't, why isn't my wife more like the woman in that movie? Why isn't my husband uh, more, more like so-and-so at church? They're always so kind and polite to their wife. Why couldn't I have married someone like Harold? Why couldn't I have married someone like Rena? You, know, you start doing these crazy thoughts in your head, and listen, that becomes very, very dangerous. You say, well, I, I would never act on it. That's just something I think about. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, Verse 27 and 28, he said, You've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Can I tell you something? Those love letters to somebody online, that's adultery. Okay? You sitting there fantasizing wishing you were with somebody else or maybe when you're in the arms of your spouse you're actually thinking in that and wishing you were in the arms of somebody else that is wrong everybody say no fantasy this should answer the question for those of you who've always wanted to ask uh, a pastor well is it a sin for us to have fantasies in the bedroom if you're pretending to be anybody other than yourself yes it is okay the only person you should ever pretend to be is you and the only person you should ever think about is your spouse can i get an amen, amen. just throwing that out there in job they said if your heart in job 31 verse 9 through 12 he said if my heart has been seduced by a woman or if I have lusted for my neighbor's wife he goes on to say it's a shameful sin a crime that should be punished listen to what else he says he says it is a fire that burns all the way to hell it would wipe out everything I own deal with fantasies okay if you don't deal with fantasies, if you don't repent of that and get that out of your life, it'll burn your marriage down. It'll burn your life down. It'll burn down your relationship with God. It says it burns all the way to hell. Everybody say no fantasy. No fantasy. The only person your heart's desire should ever be for is your spouse. I get it, though. You say, but I'm fatigued, and we've been fighting, and we're just tired, and there's so much frustration. Listen, the Bible says that you have not because you ask not. Ask God to help you with your marriage. Ask God. Say, God, give me the wisdom to be a better husband or a better wife. Help us to, to, to heal. Go get counseling if that's what you need. Find some godly counsel out there and say, hey, help us to work through these problems. We need to make our marriage better. The fact is, you don't have to give up on your marriage because though weeping endures for a night, joy comes in the morning. I want to just tell you, you can shoo that tornado out of your life. I love that. I love the story, true story. Jesse DePlantis was preaching at some church, and I think it was maybe in Louisiana or Mississippi, somewhere in that ballpark, like an F5 real tornado, not, not figurative tornado. A real F5 tornado was coming straight toward the church. And people came up to Brother Jesse and said, Brother Jesse, do we need to cancel the service? He said, no, we're not going to cancel the service. He went to the front door of the church, spread the doors open wide, said, everybody lift your hands toward that tornado. And he said, tornado, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you and command you to turn around and go the other way. He said, that tornado lifted up into the sky, and they never saw it again. He said, I went back to the pulpit and started preaching. Now, I'm telling you that because you can speak to your marriage tornado and say, marriage tornado, you get back up and go back into the sky. This frustration is going to leave. The fighting is going to leave. The false assumptions are going to leave. The fatigue is going to leave. And there will be no fantasies in my marriage. I'm going to be happy and satisfied with my wife or my husband. Amen? Amen. You receive the word of the Lord tonight? No more frustration. No more false assumptions, no more fighting, no more fatigue, no more fantasy. God's going to, I believe, bring healing to your marriage. Amen? Here's what I want you to do. I want to pray for you. And this, I'm going to ask you to lift your hands for one of two things. One, uh, if you're here and you'd say, I'm dealing with some tornado damage in my marriage. Maybe you're dealing with frustration or you're dealing with fatigue or one of the other F words that I talked about. Uh, I want, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in just a moment. But also... If you're here and you say, well, Pastor, my marriage is good, but I know somebody that I need to pray for. Their marriage is struggling. Maybe they're having that tornado in their life. 
then I'm going to ask you to lift your hands up so, and, and intercede for them. So whether you need it or you just know someone who needs it, would you lift your hands up right now and let's pray. Father, I'm praying for every marriage that may be dealing with a, with a tornado ripping apart their life. God, I just rebuke frustration in the name of Jesus. And I say you're going to open people's eyes so they can see clearly and they're going to get that, the source of the frustration out of the marriage in Jesus' name. I thank you, God, that you're going you're gonna to clear people's minds and open their eyes up to see clearly so there are no false assumptions. No false assumptions. I, I need to share this with you. I had it in my notes, and I forgot it, but I feel like the Lord just told me I need to tell you this. You need to understand something about assumptions. Assumptions will multiply. The Bible says that uh, Jesus said this. He said, judge, and you will be judged. And he goes on to say, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will it be poured back to you? The Bible says you will reap what you sow. If you sow one corn kernel, you don't get one corn kernel back. You get, you get thousands of corn kernels back. You need to understand this. If you've got false assumptions in your life, if, you, if you're judging your spouse and assuming things, that's going to get multiplied in your life. You're going to have more and more of those thoughts, and you're going to plant those thoughts in your spouse. So I rebuke those in the name of Jesus. I say no more false assumptions. No more trying to read between the lines. You're going you're gonna to allow the Lord to give you divine discernment and wisdom. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke fighting and fatigue. And I say the fighting, the fighting is going to subside. You're going to have healing in replace of that. I thank you. You're gonna, even when you have disagreements, you're not going to let those things simmer. You're going to deal with them before the sun can go down. You're going to deal with it quickly. You're going to be healed, and your marriage is going to be restored. I say God is going to going to remove the fatigue and is going to put joy in your marriage, peace in your marriage, strength and encouragement in your marriage in the name of Jesus. And I just thank you right now, anyone that's been struggling with fantasies, I, I pull those strongholds down from your mind in the name of Jesus. We are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. I say any hold that any thought may have over you that's being pulled down right now in the name of Jesus, and you will no longer fantasize about any other life other than the one God has given you. You will be content in the name of Jesus. I speak contentment over your life and your marriage in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>